So, uh, good morning, everybody. I think we'll get started now. Um, it's uh, 25 to 10. Uh, so, welcome to um, the second day of the this, this HPC carpentry workshop. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know quite many how many of you were here yesterday, um, compared or, or are just here for today. Um, but there will be the opportunity to. We'll go back over at the start of the day. Uh, some material that was covered yesterday more quickly um, and make sure that everybody can still connect to the system and that, that, that'll be the focus of um, the, what we're doing before um, the first break um, and then after that we'll get into the meat of uh, learning how to use um, HPC systems and um, what they mean and what and, and best practice and those sort of things. Um, a couple a few housekeeping things before we get started uh, properly so um, if you were here yesterday, you probably already saw this there, but this is our sort of um, etiquette for the course to try and make it run smoothly in this online forum. Um, so you should abide by our training code of conduct. This is really uh, quite important. Um, what it essentially comes down to is um, be kind to people and use, we use welcoming inclusive language, be respectful of people's different viewpoints and experiences. Um, Greece, you know, accept, accept constructive criticism. And if you're going to, you know, offer criticism or ideas, then please try to be constructive, uh, focused on what's best for the community, in this case, our, our training course here, um, and, and show courtesy and respect um, towards people in all your interactions. Um, uh, and if you feel that uh, that hasn't happened, then please do um, let me know either via the chat or um, my email is also on the course page. You can, you can get me directly that way. If, it, if it's me that you feel is behaving inappropriately, um, then um, the code of conduct uh, links on the website provide links to um, places where you can raise that with other people. Uh, but hopefully, uh, but I, you know, I think if we could all behave kindly to each other, that makes the training much better for everybody and um, makes it work out work better for work better for everybody involved. Um, obviously, um, we're all a bit quite used to uh, sort of online meetings and things like that over the past past year. Um, but if you could please mute yourself when, if you're not speaking, that avoids uh, background no noise and interference. Um, use the chat to ask questions in, in the first instance is probably the easiest way to do it. I've got a number of um, helpers along uh, with me today. Um, we've got Eleanor, George and Julian, um, some of which you will have met yesterday as well. Um, and they will be keep, keep an eye on the chat and may answer some of the questions on my behalf. Um, and as Julian's just pointed out, the chat is here so that um, actually, yes, yeah, so on the bottom right hand corner of the collaborate interface, because I know it isn't the usual Zoom or things like that people inter inter are used to, there's um, a little purple tab with a couple of left pointing chevrons on it. If you click that, um, it expands out, and chat is one of the options um, at the bottom there uh, that, that Julian was using just a moment ago. And if you do want to speak or ask questions, that's fine to ask questions that way as well. Um, please raise your hand. Um, and the interface should tell me when people raise their hands and I'll try and stop uh, at the, either straight away or if that's not possible, as soon as possible to ask you, uh, allow you to ask questions um, as well. Please feel free to interrupt and ask questions as we go along. You know, this is this works uh, much better, this training, when it's a sort of interactive and um, we have a chat. So if something occurs to you, um, please do feel free to ask. You know, there, there's, there is not, there, there aren't any there isn't such a thing as a stupid question. Um, you know, until you know something, nothing is a stupid question, essentially. Um, and as George has also pointed out in the chat, um, as with the other sessions we ran yesterday, this session's being recorded um, as well. Though we do anonymize um, the chat and um, questions and things like that as much as possible um, after, 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 before it's put online for people. So, um, does anybody have any questions about those housekeeping things or before I get started? I'm going to go and share my screen and, and to give you a chance to ask questions while I get that set up. Give me a second. It's asking me um, to give Chrome permission to share the screen, unfortunately. Uh, which I thought was already set up because I've used this quite a few times before, but apparently not at this time. Uh, 
and let me check through. Okay, I'm going to have to quit my browser and restart it. So I'm going to drop out the session just quickly. Sorry, I have shared my screen many times through Chrome. I don't understand why it's asking me again. Apologies to this inconvenience. I'm going to drop out and restart straight away, and I'll be back in a moment. While Anne is rejoining, we'll grab the links to the material and we'll paste them into the chat so that if you want to be able to follow along with the uh, printed material, or if you want to use the etherpad, um, you can do that. I'll dig those links out and I'll put them in the chat just now. So sorry about that. I am back and I will do that again and hopefully this time it will just work. Andy, I've said we'll paste a couple of links into the chat while you're getting set up. One is the link to the course material, and the other one is the Etherpad, if you want to use that for um, people to share notes during the course. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, George. That's very useful. Uh, OK, so uh, here we are. We, hopefully, people can see my screen. Um, um, and uh, this, is, this is the link that um, Julian shared, uh, the first of Julian's link, which is the sort of course website. And this is what we're going to do. I don't know how many of you have been to carpet, carpentry style workshops before, um, but typically what we do, rather than having lectures followed by practicals, is we work through the material together. So at the start of the session, we've got a bit of a sort of conceptual and conceptual material where there's not much practical work to be done but as we go through the day um we'll be more and more so of the type where we where i do something um, and then we follow along and um, together and at various points i'll check that everybody is is keeping up and um, that we're all in the same sort of place and then later on in the day in the afternoon there'll be some uh, parts where there's more sort of practical focus stuff where you'll be doing stuff on your own with the helpers around to help you out so that's how I run it. The first thing I want to say before we get really, really quite start, really started is the schedule. It's something about the schedule. So um, we're supposed to, you know, initially we're down to run from 9.30 until 4 this afternoon. Um, we started a little bit late to give people a chance to join. That's fine. Um, and that won't be a problem. Um, I don't, we'll work through the material at the pace that suits people, right? I want to make this as useful uh, for um, you guys, the attendees on the course, as possible. You know, so if we need to go um, slower at some points because people have questions, that's no problem whatsoever. You know, it's here to be useful for you, not to strict rigidly um, to um, timings and exactly that. Having said that, what I will do, because I think it helps people plan their day better, is no matter what point we're at, um, I'm going to stop for lunch at almost exactly midday and restart again at 1.30 uh, because I think that allows people to plan um, their day and other things they're going on the day so i'll try and keep uh, you know i'll try as much as possible to keep the lunch fixed at that time and to be um, the length specified of an hour and a half um but around that uh, we might take breaks slightly in slightly different periods for uh, slightly different times from when they're indicated on the schedule it just depends how um, fast or slow we go through the material and what questions that people have but please um don't worry about timings and feel that you're disrupting the times you're asking questions, please just ask the questions because genuinely it's so much better if, if we make this as useful as possible to you and answer uh, the things you need to know um, as we go through. Um, so it may help you if you go to the link and follow through on um, the website um, as well along with me. Um, you, I'll try and keep it up on my screen as well and as readable as possible. Um, I also have my terminal here, which hopefully um people can uh can read um that maybe is a bit small looking at the rendering on my screen so what i'll do is i'll make it a little bit bigger and hopefully that'll make it easier for uh people to actually see um can everybody read the text on my terminal or is it still a bit too small please let me know now because there's gonna be uh, as we go through the day there's gonna be a lot of work on the terminal Fine, cool, thank you. Okay, it's a bit too small for you, Sal. Okay, I will make it a little bit bigger again. That's fine. Just let me see, get the right combination of keys on my keypad. Is that big enough? No? Great, okay, cool. 
we'll take it from there. Um, if at any point you don't understand anything or things aren't clear on the screen or it's not visible, then please do just let me know um, and I will, I will do my best to make it bigger and make it visible to you. So, um, so for those of you here yesterday, you learned a lot about, you probably learned a bit about using uh, command line and the shell. Um, today, we're going to talk, um, like I said, we're going to cover again why use an HPC system. Some of you yesterday might have seen some of this, this type of material before, but it is a little bit different from uh, the stuff that's in the HPC shell part of the course. Um, then we're going to make sure um, everybody can log in and underst understand a bit how we can uh, work on a remote system uh, before the, and the main bunk of the practical stuff before lunch is looking at how we use the batch system, which is fundamentally and key to um, a large amount of how we use HPC systems. And then there's some various topics after lunch, um, depending on what pace we're going at, looking at um, how we access different software, um, how we transfer files, both um, from remote, from remote to remote systems, from our local system or from elsewhere, um, how we might think about using resources effectively. So how can we tell if we're actually using the resources we've been granted on HPC system in, a, in an efficient manner? And then finally, um, a session on you know how we can be or be good HPC citizens and use uh, use the shared resources um, responsibly. So I'm going to start out with talking about why people uh, might use um, an HPC system. And you know, generally the the reason people might come come to remote computing systems, actually in general rather than high performance computing systems, is that the requirements for their research or the work they want to do have outgrown the capabilities of the facilities, facility they have available. And that at the moment is generally some of these laptop, potentially uh, desktop um, sitting in the office uh, where, they, where they work. You know, so they may be there running um, things like um, different data analysis problems on their laptop or even some modeling software, um, so something that's doing, for example, biomolecular simulation like uh, Gromax or um, these sorts of things, which have been wor working quite happily um, on the local system you have access to and running fast enough. Or, you know, things have grown, but it's still been manageable. But you have these problems of, you know, you maybe need to leave it running on your laptop overnight uh, with your laptop switched on for things to happen. Or, you know, while, it, while your laptop's working on it, you can't do other things and things like that. So typically, the reason people step to uh, go and to use remote computing systems is that the problem has grown larger um, than they can treat on the uh, local resources they have available. And, you know, by larger, that could be many different things here. You know, so that could mean, um, for an example, uh, for this first example in the bullet point here, you know, that could mean it's just going to take too long. Um, you know, I've been treating small problems and suddenly the longer problem means that actually to do my research program is just going to take a ridiculous amount of time. Um, so I need to do something different there, um, either by making it faster is one way, by using a more powerful computer somehow, um, or changing it so we're running, doing more, we can do more things in parallel rather than doing one at a time, which would be the problem um, with things running too long. Um, another a uh, case might be that you run out of memory, you know, that you're, you're, you're using your local system as a certain amount of memory, and the problem you want to treat is just too big now and won't fit on the memory capacity that you have available on your local system. Okay, so it's too large in memory. So you either need another system with more memory or, again, potentially to split it up so each of the uh, different parts can use a small amount of memory um, to get the results in the end together. Um, and then, you know, other things are, you know, the calculation becomes too large for the computer in both um, either time, in both time and memory at the same time. You know, so you're running a, a modeling package and the example they have here is a CFD modeling package, but it could be anything, you know, it could be, um, like I say, molecular simulation, it could be quantum chemistry, it could be um, climate um, or any of these sorts of things. And it's just unfeasible to treat the problem either because we've increased the complexity of the model or the size of the model or the resolution um, of the model that we want to use. Um, and in all of these cases, we just need something either, either more resource or a larger uh, resource. Now, there are a number of different uh, types of remote resources you may have heard of. 
you're obviously on this course, so you've heard of HPC, at least in some context, and high performance computing in some context, and what that may mean, and that's what we're going to look at uh, today. But um, you may also have heard of cloud computing and things like Amazon Web Services, AWS, um, the Google Compute Cloud. Um, and um, as you're from Microsoft. And you know, sometimes uh, people are wonder what the difference between this sort of the, the, the HPC per se and um, using these sorts of commercial cloud resources is. And the answer is, in some cases, not a lot, right? I mean, in both cases, there are things that are generally not local to you. You ask access remotely in some way, um, and they have more capacity than you have available locally. Um, so, for example, on both HPC systems and on uh, commercial cloud, you may find you get access to individual computers. You know, let's call them nodes. We'll come across the term. We'll talk about terminology a bit more later. Um, that have larger, more powerful processors, um, higher number of uh, computing cores, uh, maybe access to GPUs or um, some other accelerator. Also, maybe more memory um, available than you would have on your local system. And the same is true of HPC systems as well. So. Um, Typically, the difference between HPC systems and the cloud, apart from the fact that the cloud stuff is typically commercial and HPC systems that most people get access, particularly academics, are not um, a commercial resource, is that um, HPC systems are designed to treat, to treat problems in parallel more in a different sort of way from, from the cloud, cloud resources. So in HPC systems, we, we tend to couple closely all the processing cores together using a high performance interconnect, um, which means that they can talk to each other uh, very quickly and exchange a lot of data. Um, and typically in the commercial cloud, though, there are, there, there are exceptions and things are changing and there is some sort of convergence um, underway here. Um, you'll find that um, they're more like individual computers that can work independently and potentially have can bring resources together on shared storage or things like that. Um, and they don't have that same high performance interconnect. But as I said, that is not um, hard and fast and there is convergence there. You know, you can buy um, tightly coupled HPC resources in the commercial cloud now, uh, generally not on the scale as those available um, through the sorts of traditional HPC systems, um, but it is definitely moving in that direction. For example, the UK Met Office, you know, they've just uh, announced in the last few months that they want a contract um, to host the next um, they have large supercomputers for weather forecasting and climate modeling, and that isn't going to be entirely provided within um, the Azure cloud from Microsoft. I mean, it's actually going to be an HPE Cray system like um, Archer 2, which you're using today, embedded within the cloud, but the access model is still cloud-like. Okay, so there is this convergence going on in, in the future. So um, there's a small exercise, exercise here um, about talking to your neighbor, your office mate, or rubber ducking for those people who've come across that term before where you speak to a rubber duck about your problems and that helps you solve them. Um, but actually, I think what I'd like to do is, is for people to, you know, um, take a moment, um, particularly those people who weren't here on the course tomorrow, because I course yesterday, sorry, because I know there was a similar um, exercise yesterday, is to take a moment, go to the EFA pad, which was the second, second link that uh, Julian put up there, and just write a sentence um, about how computing currently helps you in your research and why you want to access more computing. So that's two sentences. One, essentially, that says how you're doing computing now. And a second one um, that says um, how more computing could potentially help you, which is essentially why you're on this course. And um, so it's now um, essentially five to ten. So I'll give you till ten o'clock um, to have a go at that, to have a go at that. And then we'll pick up um, with the rest of this session. Uh, but also, of course, in this break, please feel free to ask questions if anything's clear or you, anything's not clear or, you know, or even if you're just curious um, about anything I've said, please um, just let me know. Okay, so I'm, I'm just keeping, I'm just kind of having a look at the uh, EVA pad, what people have put there, you know, and you know, I, I think it re reflects exactly um, the sorts of things, you know, was, uh, I, I, I mentioned there, you know, people either on just not able to use um, a local resource for what they want to do. So HPC is a pre or, or some sort of remote, more powerful computing resource is a prerequisite of what they need to do their research. Um, 
or you know that in some cases you know some work has been some research has been able to do could be done on the local resources but the the, the scale fidelity or the um, um the, you know it, the, the size of the research they want to do means that that's just not feasible um anymore or the other thing that comes up here you know both uh, a couple of people both uh, particularly in terms of astronomy and uh, genomics I've mentioned that there's a big problem with the amount of data. And that's one thing I didn't really talk about, you know, is that um, the other thing that remote facilities often have is access to large, um, fast, powerful um, data storage um, platforms that are then coupled uh, to the compute that allows you to uh, do the analysis there. So you may also have outgrown um, the ability to store and process the data um, locally as well. So you need to you need to do something else there. And I know both for genomics and astronomy, there's, there, 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 can, there can often be these um, these challenges, particularly in terms of pipelines, in that, you know, the data's coming in, you have to do the analysis on, on a certain time scale and get the data out again, because you can't really um, store it all in one place, you know, so some analysis and, um, has to happen on the fly for um, large scale sequ sequencing and uh, astronomy data sets, for example. The same is true of, um, for example, the Large Hadron Collider. At CERN and the amount of data they produce, you know, you have to reduce the amount of data by doing processes on the fly and then pushing it out to the researchers. Okay, so uh, here I, I think this is generally uh, one other one other uh, point that's raised there. I see somebody say, said there uh, one thing about um, HP access to HPC systems is they can give you licenses for um, other software that you need to use that, that, that may be too expensive for you to purchase um, on your own. And yeah, uh, that, that can definitely be true. Um, though in some cases, or in a lot of cases, particularly um, on the HPC systems we we use or we run here, um, often it's expected that researchers uh, bring their own um, licenses with them um, for the software they want to use. Um, so the service generally doesn't provide that. But you know, I think that raises an important point. I mean, one thing you have to consider when you get moving to these remote facilities is what software is available, and um, <laughs> no, these, no, I mean, so it depends on the focus of the service, right? Some some uh, HPC systems do come along with and um, purchase software. It depends on how their funding works um, and um, what sort of audience they're uh, they're aimed at. So it's it's different for different people. But it is a key point: is that one thing you have to check when go moving to the HPC system is that they support um, the software. Um, that you want to that you want to use and what you actually want to do is feasible or whether any how much work might be needed to pull from your side so um let's move on uh, a bit here from where where we were so you know i i think that most yeah sorry somebody's uh, put their hand up yeah. george it's maybe a bit much for this course, but it probably is worth noting that there is a sort of general philosophy towards trying to use open software for your research. Um, licensed software in certain domains is very important and plays, in, and plays a key role in doing analysis, but it does mean that users tend to be locked into certain software products and it means that they have less opportunity to move their research or to validate their research. And they also rely on vendors if, for example, there's a problem with the software or if there's um, a feature in other competing software that you'd like to have in the software you use. Now, open source isn't a silver bullet because you'd still need somebody to write those features or fix those bugs. But generally, it's felt that the open software where the community and especially experts in the community can contribute tends to produce um, better long-term and more sustainable research. So it is worthwhile thinking about open solutions and license-free solutions when you can, not just because they're cheaper. Yeah, thank you, George. Yeah, uh, that is an important point. So we don't talk much about uh, sustainability and research reproducibility on this course. It's much more focused on using the systems and you know getting going on HPC systems. But you're right, there are, there are a lot of wider considerations about why you should choose particular so types of software for research and what impact that has on uh, the sustainability and reproducibility of, of those research programs in the future. Um, and, you know, people want to discuss that, I'm happy to chat about it um, over time. I'm sure we all are happy to chat about it. It's a very interesting area. And so I'm going to quickly run over um, some differences between laptops and HPC systems. So a laptop 
essentially consists of um, some sort of input, often keyboard, touchpad, um, sometimes mouse and things like that, touch screens to tell it what to do. The internal resources that actually do things, that's the CPU and the processor, often referred to as the processor and the memory and the storage, of course, as well. And then um, some sort of output. And that could be in terms of um, display, sound, um, or, you know, or um, any, anything like that. So, so this looks like, yeah, I mean, this is, this is essentially a schematic of a simple computer. You've got some inputs that push the input in. The CPU, the processor, does work along with the me by using memory to store the data and access the data. And then the output comes out, and that output might be pushed onto storage. It could be pushed onto a screen. It could be making sounds. It could be any of those things. And when things become too big or too long, um, you t tend to try and use um, other uh, remote services instead the, 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 and exploit them actually using your laptop still as the input device, but connecting them um, to remote resources. So, for example, uh, the example they give here is that, you know, the capability laptop are not typically not enough to calculate a route, a route spontaneously. Um, for, for, through the next directions, find the shortest path through the network it is, is a very large um, and computationally hard task, especially when um, there's lots of different routes on a potential map to do that. And what you typically do then is, is farm that off to a server that has more powerful compute resources. Um, and so what do we mean by server and HPC systems are just types of servers, really. It's essentially a computer mounted in a rack cabinet that resides in the dense center. It says noisy here, and often um, that's not necessarily the case. Um, if, you were to, uh, if you were able to come to the data center and see Archer 2, you'd see it's actually quite quiet, uh, because most of the noise from servers uh, tends to come from fans and cooling, uh, because Archer 2 is cooled by passing liquid around uh, the system instead. It's actually much cooler, because uh, it's much quieter, because it doesn't have all the fans attached to it. OK, and do you know, and we've mentioned cloud already, and the cloud is actually really just lots of servers out there that you can access via, usually via a web inter web based interface. Um, so it's often often through a browser. So for example, um, you know you go to Google Maps, right, and off you go, and that uses the ser servers in Google's compute cloud um, to do the hard computations about estimating what the qu quickest route is to get somewhere. Uh, when you're on holiday or to find to share with you images of places via uh, street view or things like that okay and the server itself has no outputs inputs sorry it has no direct um you know, uh, keyboards or um, screens attached to it generally but it does have lots more resources and the way it gets its input and output is by um the uh, connections to the internet or um, by the network connections. You know, all the inputs come in by the network connections and all the outputs are sent back to you via the network connections. And when you need to use lots of servers together um, in parallel, um, that, can, that can add, you know, uh, that, that, that is one, one way of connecting them all together to do things that ends up being called high performance computing. Um, and you may hear other terms for HPC systems. Clusters is commonly used for, for smaller scale HPC systems, and for the very and for larger ones such as Archer two, and they're often referred to as things like super, uh, by the term supercomputers. And the difference here um, for between just connecting lots of servers together uh, via network cables or, or via standard network cables is that on an HPC system we connect all the servers together using a high performance interconnect that allows lot data to pass much more efficiently between them. And what that means, you can do things in parallel that don't aren't necessarily asynchronous, where all the parallel tasks have to be kept um, in step in some way. Okay. And having the fast interconnect there allows that to happen in an efficient manner. Um, so the method, the, the, the major difference from a laptop, I guess, other than the fact that the computing resource is bigger is much bigger, is how the input and output works. You know, um, instead of, um, you know, pointing and clicking on things, you tend to work by a command line interface uh, rather than graphic user interface. And, you know, the, the part of the course yesterday was a lot about learning to use that command line interface, which is generally something called Bash from uh, Linux. And you tend to work with a distributed set of computers, which are called nodes, uh, rather than the machine attached to the keyboard and mouse. So the, the, this concept of, you know, you're interacting with the machine and you'll see that um, at least 
when we start using the system, you know, you directly interact with the machine, but that's not not usually actually the same computer or node that's doing the actual work, the heavy computational work or the heavy memory work or the heavy IO work. You know, they are farmed out um, in the background to lots of other um, to, to lots of other nodes. Um, so uh, there's a little thing here. I mean, this question, you know, when we when first HP Cloud, you first thought that most people weren't very au okay with servers and understanding, and it was just like, well, I've never used a server, and you know, this is all a bit daunting. But you know, I think people are much more comfortable with that now, given uh, the way things like um, Gmail and um, Outlook and things like that, people are much more aware that, that they are using some sort of server-based, um, you know, resources. You know, so you know, day to day, our, our life relies on using um, servers out in the cloud. Um, you know, that's how our smartphones work, and that's how everybody's personal email works. And actually, most institutional emails now, people are switching over to Office 365 and, you know, um, the commercial Google offering and things like that. You know? So I think people are much more comfortable with the idea that a lot of the inputs they put into their um, laptop or their phone or whatever doesn't actually get done there. You know, it goes out into what we call the cloud and actually the computation and the work, a lot of the hard work is done there. Okay, and there's a few examples there. I'm not gonna go through them because I, like I say, I think people are much more comfortable with this um, uh, than they used to be. So, um, you know, uh, high performance computing, I think typically involves connecting to a very large computing system somewhere else, okay? And the reason we do this is because these systems can do work that would be impossible or much slower on the smaller systems. And the standard method of interacting with these systems is via a command line interface rather than a point and click, um, you know, an interface that we're used to say through Windows or Mac OS. Okay. So I'm gonna move on to the next section now, um, which we're gonna to use to check that um, everybody can connect uh, to the system and talk a bit more, connect, connect to Archer 2 itself and make sure that's up and running. That's often one of the trickiest bits in this and the trees bits to debug. And we'll have a talk about what these systems actually look like. So all of these systems we've mentioned before, you know, cloud, cluster, high performance computing, are used in different contexts. And I've already talked about what um, uh, cloud is and what HPC, house HPC systems um, differ, which is typically because of the way they're integrated together with lots of high performance components, both the interconnect and also generally high performance storage um, as well as using processors um, and potentially things like accelerators like GPUs to give really high performance computing um, in terms of flow within point operations, which is they're actually doing the maths and the number crunching, and also um, the power of the memory and how you can access uh, memory fast enough to be able to feed these um, processors that are doing heavy computation work fast enough um, that they're being used efficiently. Um, and I've mentioned what uh, the cluster is often a small scale HPC. So the first step, you know, often is how we get what's called a lot typically called logging in is how we get on to the um, HPC system from our laptop. Um, so, you know, as I've mentioned, we're used to having this sort of point and click and graphical interface a lot. But as the compute clusters are remote resources that we connect to often over very long internet connections, you know, I mean, I, uh, for example, I, was, I use um, HPC systems in Japan and things like that, you know, and the, the path over to Japan uh, from the UK is quite a long uh, network path and passing all the information and the graphical required uh, to require to drive a graphical interface is very inefficient. Over that. Whereas passing back information that just uses typed commands is much more efficient and work um, much better. So we tend to use a command prompt of some sort to access um, our remote system. And hopefully you've all been through the setup instructions for the course and know where your command prompt is. You know, on Mac OS, which is what I'm using here, um, you get this terminal, um, which allows you to type in commands and for the computer to respond to them. On Windows, there's PowerShell um, or Mobile X term, depending on the path you're using. Um, and on Linux, you know, if you're using Linux, you're generally pretty comfortable with the command line anyway, because a lot of operations have to be done on the command line via Linux. Okay, um, so you may have already used these things. If you were here yesterday, you definitely have already used these things. And what you tend to do is issue a command that goes over the internet and connects to uh, some part of the cluster. 
and then you can issue and then you can issue commands to the cluster or the HPC system rather than um, your own local computer. So you issue a command on the local computer and instantiate a connection. Um, and then that gives you the interface where you can issue commands um, to the uh, remote system. So let's try and log in uh, right, right now. So the, the, you tend to need an address to log into, which is where uh, the system you can access to access this. Ours is login.archer2.iec.uk. I do need your user ID. This was the uh, user ID you got through SAFE when you applied um, for access as part of the setup instructions here. So I'm going to do that on my system and then hopefully um, let you all have a go. The one, the wrinkle on Archer 2 is that you need both an SSH key and a password um, to connect. And usually you need, to, and often you'll need to specify the path for the SSH key, especially if you keep it in a location that is not um, the standard location of your laptop. And I don't, so I'm going to have to give it that. So I'm going to type SSH, which is the command we use to access secure shell. Um, I'm going to give it the path to, path to my um, key using the minus I, just tells it what, what identity key to use. So I've got all the mine start, uh, stores ID, RSA, Archer. And then I'm going to give my user ID. My user ID for this course is uh, my initials and then T028, which I think is the uh, course ID, and then the address for the computer. So that's login.archer2.ac.uk. Okay. Um, what you'll see with mine is because I have um, my key is already loaded into what's called an SSH agent on my system, it won't ask me for the passphrase of my SSH key, unfortunately. Um, so you'll just see it asking for the password on the system. When you log in, unless you have an agent running where you've already added your SSH key, you'll get two prompts, one for the passphrase for your key, and then one um, for the um, password um, for your account. You can, which you uh, the first time you get that, you get that from the safe interface, and then the second, and then you get uh, off, uh, you're offered to change that. Yes, Julian. Um, I think it should be TA028 rather than T028. Yes, thank you, Julian. Well spotted. That deliberate typo. I was wondering earlier would you spot that. <laughs> okay, so it has asked me for my key passphrase because it's in the agents, but it does ask me my password for the system. So let's type that in. So mine was very long. One thing you will have noted there, hopefully, is that when I was typing my password, there were no stars, no characters, nothing appeared at all. That is normal for password entry um, on via SSH, is that you don't see um, stars or dots or anything appear. So it can feel sometimes like you're not typing at all. And it can be hard if you make a mistake when you're typing your password to know how far you are through. Typically, if I feel like I've made a mistake typing my password, I just use the Control C command, which cancels the command and start again from scratch. Um, otherwise, I don't know where I've been, where I am in the, typing the password, and it's quite difficult. So once you log in, um, once you've done that, you should get the interface back, but it should have changed um, uh, to indicate potentially that you're on Archer 2. So actually, we see a banner um, saying you're on Archer 2, and then we get our prompt back, but it looks different from the prompt that I had um, on my local system. So can I ask everybody to um, try and log in now? Um, yes, George. Andy, if it's useful, I can show the equivalent process for logging in from a Windows laptop while people are uh, logging in. Yes, if you want, that's fine. Let me stop sharing my screen and then you can share your screen. Um, if everybody lo logs in, I'll put up a little poll to check that people have logged in. If you're running into pr problems, please put your hand up and um, either myself or one of the helpers will come and help you um, get logged in. I'll stop sharing, George, so you can. Cool. OK, so if you're on Windows and you were in the course yesterday, you will have hopefully downloaded Mobile X term. There are several ways to connect, but the way we've asked you to do is to use the Start Local Terminal button. And if you click that, it creates a terminal, but this is running on your laptop. And then just as Andy did within that terminal, you type SSH and use minus I to specify where your identity is. Mine is actually in the standard place, which is in the hidden dot SSH directory. And then it's called ID underscore RSA. Um, that's the default 
name for the certificate. And in fact, if that's the name you've given your certificate and the location you've put it, then, uh, sorry, key, I keep talking, then you don't need to specify that, but it doesn't hurt. My username is G Beckett, and again, it's login.archer2.ac.uk. Julian, does that look right? Let's go with yes. Yes. Okay. So I will submit that command and hopefully it will connect. Right. So it says, um, give me the machine password. So I shall type that. That's the username and password combination I have for Archer 2. And because I haven't um, pre authorized my key pair, it'll ask me for the passphrase for my key. which I'll also type. Um, now, I don't know if you can see, but on my screen, I have a pop-up that asks me for my machine password. Again, it says SSH-browser password. You can safely ignore that. However, if you do type your password in there, it will um, set up a, a bit like an FTP connection to the remote system. So this is my home directory on Archer 2. Um, and sometimes it's useful to have that alongside your um, terminal window so you can click through files. But I'm going to hide that for now, and hopefully you can see I'm also connected to Archer 2. But instead of using a Mac or a Linux terminal, I'm just using Mobrex terminal windows. Are there any quick questions? Otherwise, I'll stop sharing and let Andy resume. Okay, um, I can see uh, we've got we're up to 10 people have managed to connect, so that's pretty good so far. We've, uh, uh, five people haven't responded yet. Um, I'm assuming they're still working on and trying to get that working. Ah, but well, some of them are the, uh, are, the um, are, are the helpers, of course, so they don't count because they're not real people. Um, right, so I think almost everybody, as far as I can see from the participants, has connected. So what I'll do is I'll move on. If it, it, I think there's only one person who hasn't said yes to this. If you are having problems, please uh, put your hand up. Uh, one of the helpers uh, will come and help you with your connection. Oh, perfect. Everybody says yes now. So that's great. Thank you, everybody. That was much smoother than I was expecting, I have to say. This is usually from a place where we have lots of problems. OK, <clears throat> so now we're on um, our local local system. You know, um, you can see. Um, if I type host name, that will tell me uh, the name of the computer. And you can see here it's called UAN01, which doesn't seem to, make, uh, doesn't seem to match very well onto um, what we said the HPC system was called, which is Archer 2. Um, this is just a byproduct of the type of system it is, which is an HP Cray um, EX system. And these, uh, UAN here stands for user access node. Okay. I will talk about um, different type of types of nodes in, in, in a moment. Um, but user access node is just another way of saying a login node. Okay. Um, and so it says what's in your home directory. The user, the, the system administrator may have configured your directory with some helpful files, folders, and links um, to people. Well, unfortunately, uh, Archer 2 doesn't seem to be that helpful because my user um, home directory is empty. Um, but I can see where, so, so LS shows um, what's in there, and PWD just prints the current working directory. And you can see um, it has my username in and my project ID in it as well on slash home. Um, so, you know, everybody's uh, directory should look um, a little bit different. So, you know, if we, if we look here, um, you can see uh, with PWD that the reason my home directory is unique because it contains my username. Um, and my project. So everybody has their own unique code directory on, on the system. So I said we well, was going to mention nodes. So we've mentioned the term nodes before uh, to refer to the individual sort of computers that make up um, our HPC system or cluster or, or supercomputer or whatever you want to do. Um, typically, there are different types of nodes for different purposes. And some of them um, you're, you will use often, 
and some of them are invisible to users generally and sit in the background. So for example, um, ones that we use all the time are called login nodes. That's generally where we access the system. In this case, they're also called UANs. Um, but also you'll see them referred to as head nodes, um, landing pans, submit nodes, or all those sorts of things. And, and, and typically these are a gateway system. You know, they're usually pretty powerful. Um, they're designed for downloading files, setting up software, off, sometimes running quick tests. Um, and but generally a login node is shared between everybody on the system and shouldn't be used for any time consuming or resource and intensive stuff you know and if, if you run something that suddenly feels like it's taking a long time on the login node then it may be worth thinking about um submitting that uh, as a job to the compute nodes which we'll talk about in a bit anyway and sometimes um Systems will also offer dedicated data transfer nodes because one of the big tasks after we need to do is move large amounts of data around both onto the system and off the system. Um, at the moment, Archer 2 doesn't have um, dedicated data transfer nodes. Um, as it's upgraded throughout its lifetime, it will um, get to the stage where it has um, not necessarily dedicated data transfer nodes, but what we will call um, data analysis or P or post processing nodes, which will be allowed, which be enabled to transfer large amounts of data as well. But the real heavy computational work on that system, the bit that does the number crunching and does all the work, it, it, uh, is done by what are called the compute nodes um, or worker nodes. And they come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Um, on Archer 2 at the moment, they're all very homogeneous. They all look the same. Um, but they're generally powerful compute you know, you know, resources with auto memory, access to far, fast uh, and large amounts of file space, uh, of I/O space, and file space for storing data, and um, you know, lots of compute cores or powerful compute cores, and even sometimes with uh, GPU accelerators or um, other types of resources like that. And to make sure that on this shared system, everybody can get access um, to uh, those those powerful compute resources in a fair way, we use something called the scheduler. Uh, now, the scheduler is essentially a queue. Okay, so it's where you put your work in. Um, can um, people mute, please? I'm hearing a lot of background typing. Oh, sorry, it's me. I forgot to mute. Apologies, it's my. Thank you. Um, so um, the share, you know, so the scheduler controls access to resources. It's essentially a queue. I'm going to talk about it in more detail uh, uh, in in a little bit in the next session about how how, how it works and what it does. But in this case, we can use the scheduler, which knows about all the worker nodes or the compute nodes, um, and ask it what they look like. So we can use the command S info. So let's run that and see what it gives me back. So in Slurm, which is the scheduler on Arch 2, S info gives you information about the compute nodes. So this is pretty dense output, but in short, what it shows you, um, all these numbers here are IDs of separate compute nodes. Okay, so they're all called NID and then some um, identifying number, some unique number. Um, and they're all in slightly different states. So in, or it's a lot of them in different states. So the majority of the compute nodes, 913 of them, are in the state alloc, which means they're running work um, for people. They're running uh, computational work that people have submitted to them. There are um, 71 of them reserved for various purposes. Um, some of them are reserved for this course um, so that we have exclusive access to them so that your jobs run quickly so we can work through the course um, together. But there are other reservations out there as well. Uh, we use one, for example, for giving people access to resources for testing jobs before they submit them to the full queue, for example. Um, and various other ones in other states. So down um, can mean that the, the something broken on that node, it needs fixed, for example, or there's an error on the node. Uh, drain can mean they're emptying to then maybe install a software update or um, they're emptying because they need to be investigated and, and they need some work done on the month and those sort of things. Um, here you can see actually the one that's missing is idle. So sometimes you'll see nodes that are idle um, and they're nodes that are empty that don't have any work at the moment. Uh, but at the moment, all of the nodes on the system are actually allocated, reserved, down or draining. Okay. So, uh, and as well as these nodes, there are nodes in the background you never see. So these are the ones that use to manage the storage, for example, providing an interface to the fast storage, 
um, you know, managing user authentication and other stuff that just goes to work, make the system work, management nodes and things like that. But the, the system administrators is used to uh, manage the system and make sure everything runs smoothly. Um, and, you know, but typically they're not very interesting because you don't generally interact with them on a day to day basis. So all of the nodes on the HPC system are essentially a computer. Okay. So if you think of them like lots of laptops connected together, you're not far off, except that they don't have keyboards or screens. Um, and they generally are, uh, use server class parts, which are much more powerful than those that you get in laptops and desktops. Um, part of the reason is um, that, you know, your laptop, for example, finds it very difficult to get rid of heat um, very efficiently. So using a high powered hot um, processor is a, is a challenge for a laptop, whereas in Archer 2, we can use very high powered processors because we use liquid, we use, um, liquid cooling to get the heat away efficiently from the nodes. And actually, if you could go to um, the ACF where Archer 2 is housed, you'd see that, you know, compared to the size of the actual computer system itself, which is at the moment um, essentially the size of eight wardrobes or four very large wardrobes um, and a bit more, the size of that compared to the actual plant, which is the bit that provides power and all the infrastructure for cooling and getting rid of the heat is it, it, huge, right? I mean, the plant tends to be um, two, uh, like two times bigger at least than the computer itself, you know, and actually probably more than that nowadays. So, so there's this massive infrastructure in the background that's making these HPC systems work and taking the, they're taking the heat away from them. But because they're um, just computers, they have the same sort of, the, you know, the, the conceptual picture looks a bit like the picture we had before, except without, you know, we haven't noted so much of the input out devices here. So we have some memory um, and then we have the processor here, uh, which is indicated by this SI, the silicon. You know, and that consists of multiple cores. Each processor has multiple compute cores on it. And they have some sort of memory cache, which you may hear about as well. And then they're all connected to disk somehow. Okay. And of course, then all of these nodes are then connected together as well. So, you know, the, it has the CPUs or processors or cores and the RAM and disk space. The CPUs do the actual number crunching and the running the programs. Um, information at the current task is sort of memory. You know, that information goes away if power is lost. Um, or can be written over when um, new tasks start. And disk or I/O is the is the, is the persistent storage. You know, even if the computer has, has to be restarted, you know this, the, the the data on the disk persists. Um, sometimes worker nodes and compute nodes on some HPC systems might have a local disk. In general, um, often nowadays they don't, and the only storage accessible is 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 um, shared storage. You know that goes out across the interconnect. You know so all data. And stored on the storage goes out across the interconnect in the same way that data passing between um, cores on different nodes is. So now we're going to try and look at a few of the differences um, between um, our local laptop um, and what's available on the HPC system itself. Okay, so let's try and find out the number of CPUs and amount of memory available on your personal computer. If you're logged onto Archer 2, you might need to exit, but the other way to do it is just to open another terminal window or just use the graphical interface to look at um, what's available on your local computer. Um, so you can know, go, go away and see if you can find out you know, how many compute cores and how much memory is available on your local system. I'm going to, uh, for people who've got Macs, you're going to see the answer because I'm going to do it on my one, show you what I mean. So I'm, uh, on my Mac, I'm just going to go to the Apple menu. I'm going to go to about this Mac. And hopefully you can see it's a bit small. Um, so what I'll tell what I'll tell you here is um, straight away from this um, top level, I can see I've got 16 gigabytes of memory. Okay, it tells me a chip is an Apple M1, um, but that doesn't tell me how many cores there are here. And I suspect the answer might be complicated. So let me see if I can find um, some more information about that. So if I hit on system report. Now, somewhere, hopefully, there's a bit about hardware. Yeah, is there anything about processors or storage? So you can see I haven't done this for a while because I don't look at this very often. Okay, so no, it's here. It's actually just at the top level of the hardware. So it tells me the total number of I know it's a bit small. I don't think I can make it bigger here, yeah, but it tells me that I've got eight cores, uh, four performance cores and four efficiency cores, and I've got 16 gigabytes of memory. Okay. Um, so that's how I find it out 
on my Mac. On Windows, you probably have a similar um, way of doing things. If you're on Linux, um, then you may be able to use these sorts of commands, sorts of mproc minus minus all, or uh, free minus m to look at the memory, or you can read directly from the proc file system, which gives uh, information hardware, um, or you could run the system monitor, such as top or htop, um, to give you an idea of what's there. Okay, so you know, people people can have a look at that. So, so but what you'll find generally find is that um, laptops will generally have four to sixteen gig of memory, and generally have four to sixteen cores. It's that sort of scale resource. So now let's go and have a look at um, the logger node on Archer two. So we don't have a graphical interface here. But we can use the similar sorts of uh, commands that were listed uh, for Linux there because our RG2 is just running Linux as well. Actually, one of the most useful, uh, let's just actually try the commands that are there. So let's try mproc minus minus um, all on the uh, top node. Thanks, George, um, for that info. Uh, and it says there are 256 cores here on, on, the, on the login node. That's not strictly true, but I'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. But, and then let's have a look at the amount of memory, which is three minus M. Okay. And it tells me how much memory is here. And this is in kilobytes. Okay. So the total amount of memory available is around 257,000 kilobytes, which is actually 256 gig, um, I think the top of my head. So whereas my laptop had eight cores, probably in the maximum way, though it is slightly complicated with the Apple processors, what that actually means, it has eight cores and 16 gig of memory. Um, this login node has 256 cores and 256 gigabytes of memory. Okay, so it's, what's that, uh, like um, 32 times larger or something like that. And, that, and that's typical, you know, the, 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 the nodes on a computer, um, the nodes on the HPC system are much, are much larger um, and more powerful generally than what you'd have in your laptop. Um, but as George says, um, often, you know, or generally, especially on the login node, you're sharing that resource with everybody, everybody else. So we can find out how many people I'm sharing with by listing who. And anybody at the course yesterday might also have seen these sorts of things. So I can count the number of lines in who, with who, and pipe it into word count and count the number of lines. So there's like 140 users or so on the login node um, at the moment. Though you can see some people are connected multiple times. Um, so it's not 140 different people, but it's 140 different sessions, 141 different sessions. Okay. So finally, We've looked at the login nodes. Uh, we looked at our own computer, and hopefully, you know, you see that it's a much more powerful. What about the compute nodes themselves, though? How could we query um, what they look like? Well, within Slurm, you can actually use the sinfo command and give it some extra options um, uh, to ask it about a compute node. So what this is doing here is sinfo gives us information about the compute nodes or the nodes known to Slurm. We get, tell it which node, this is just picking, all the nodes on Archer 2 are the same. So we're just picking one at random here. Um, one with a certain number. And then that, this specifies the output format. And here we ask for uh, the node name, number of cores, and the amount of memory. So let's have a look at that. And I'm gonna copy and paste that. Okay. And so it tells me that the host name is, well, we knew that already. It's got 256. CPUs and 256 gigabytes of RAM. This is, in, this is in kilobytes again. So actually, the compute nodes are very similar to the login nodes on Archer, Archer, 10, on Archer 2. Okay. The difference with the compute nodes compared to the login nodes on Archer 2 is when you run jobs on the compute nodes, um, you get the whole resource to yourself. Okay. So you're not sharing it you know, with other people. Okay, so then you have all of these 256 cores to yourself and you have all of the 256 gigabytes of memory to yourself whereas on the login node just sharing that uh, with all the other people who are, who are logged on. Um, so, you know, I've, I think, you know, we, uh, run, we, we've compared the computer of the login node and the compute node here. You know, there, there are various differences and hopefully I've run through um, 
what what they are there. And some HPC systems, not Archer 2, because it's very homogeneous, but some HPC systems have a variety of nodes for different workloads. You know, some might have more memory, uh, specialized resources such as GPUs and things like that. And when the Archer 2 gets upgraded over the summer, there will be um, compute nodes with 512 gigabytes of memory, the large memory nodes, and there will be compute nodes with um, AMD GPUs, some a small number of nodes with AMD GPUs in. Um, as well. So we will have different types of nodes then as well. Um, so in the next session, we're going to talk about the um, scheduler and how to start using it to running our, what work we want to do and our, and, our, and our programs. But I think the key point we want to get across this session, apart from the fact that you can log in, is that you know, it's a set of network machines and the interconnect is um, typically powerful compared to what you'd use for, for something like the, uh, compared to say something like the internet. Um, they typically provide both login nodes and some sort of worker or compute nodes. And, you know, and the, the types of resources found on these compute nodes can vary, um, but you can query that and find out what's available. Um, the other thing we haven't talked about actually is that, well, we did mention it, but I'm not sure I mentioned this um, imp explicit impact of it. Because you're using shared storage, all the compute nodes see the same file systems and the same files, if you share save a file on one node, that's immediately available everywhere else, the same as on the login node. You know, if I change data on the login node, the compute nodes will be able to see that change data um, straight away. And the same is true um, of um, one compute node. If I save data on one compute node, then it's visible to all the other compute nodes and to the login node as well. So um, that we've reached the end of the first session there. So the next we've got a break where um, a little bit behind what actually the um, timings on the um, on the on the um, on the front page suggested, but I'm not worried about that at all. And um, like I say, we'll we'll go with the flow with that, but we will stop for lunch at um, give, give the uh, we will stop at time. So some of these so some questions here. So um, yeah, so the 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 NID thing is the node name. Every um, node on Archer two has a unique ID, and they're all named the same. Um, there's the NID and then a number. Um, so NID is just node ID, and then the number is just some number that's large enough. So you can see they've reserved enough um, places there to have up to, um, what, 999,000 nodes um, with, with the space, the number of zeros they have. Okay. Um, so, so all, up to a million, uh, you know, almost a million nodes at the, in the current support uh, for our, in the naming system they have. Um, and you can see them in SM, sorry, you can see them in SINFO. So we just do SINFO without anything. Um, these are all the node IDs here. You can see the NID and then um, all the numerical values um, here. This indicates a range. You can also use SINFO um, to list all of the nodes with a capital N. Um, and that'll show you all of the nodes uh, individually, um, and all, all of the node IDs that are available on the system. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I mean, people can feel free to ask, ask more questions. I'm going to stop there for a moment and give us 15 minutes um, for a break. My clock on my laptop makes it uh, about quarter to uh, 11. So let's say we come back at, and we'll start again at 11 o'clock sharp. Okay, um, I'm going to stick around and keep an eye on the chat and hands up and things like that. And we'll, um, yeah, so feel free to ask more questions, but feel free to go and get a joke. Uh, hey, go and get a joke. Oh my goodness, my brain's gone. Go and get a drink um, and have a break and stretch your legs. Um, please do. Um, I had this interesting discussion about gigabytes and gigabytes on, on, on the chat. Um, and I can say some more about that. I, it depends whether you're using powers of a thousand or powers of a thousand or powers of two. Essentially, the difference between gigabytes, which is the sort of SI, what you'd imagine SI units mean, and gigabytes, which is the powers of two, which makes makes probably more sense in computer architecture um, chat. It never used to matter. Is the is the key thing, you know, because the difference between the two was so small. But now we're up to the stage where, you know. Every you know standard disks are terabytes, you know, and HPC systems have tens, hundreds of petabytes. Even you know we're approaching the time when 
HPC systems are exabytes of storage, then suddenly the difference between the Power of Two version and the SI version makes a huge difference, the amount of storage that's available. So you have to now be very careful about um, which ones you're talking about when you're talking about storage with people um, and HPC systems and what that means. And the same is true going be coming true of memory. So break ends at 11 o'clock. So we'll start again at 11 a.m. UK time, sharp. Okay, um, so I'll speak to you in a little while about, and we'll go and look at using the scheduler and actually submitting some jobs to the system. Okay, so Sal says, uh, you know, if S in for minus N, word count minus L gives me 1023. So there is 1,023 nodes on the system at the moment. That's true. Okay, so when Archer is fully upgraded over the summer, there'll be, um, I think it's 5,800 and something uh, compute nodes in total. So at the moment, we've only got uh, four cabinets out of the full 23 for the system of the system. So, you know, we only have um, 130,000 cores out of the eventually more than uh, around 750,000 cores that are going to be available on the system. So this is the system at the moment you're using is a small is a smaller portion of Archer 2. Uh, um, the, the rest of the um, compute nodes are actually there on site and they're currently being um, set up and connected up and operating systems installed and tests being run and things like that. And the plan is to have them available um, later in the summer. Okay. I'll get started now anyway, because we have the majority, the, the vast majority of people here. Um, and um, I want to be able to stop for the lunch break at 12 o'clock um, sharp to give people enough time for a proper break. Um, and because they might have other things organized for that, for that time. So let me uh, stop this poll and then I can get started. Okay, so in this section, this, this, this is one of the main sections of the course. Um, we're going to look at working with the scheduler. Uh, and we've already interacted a little bit with the scheduler using the sinfo command. Um, but we'll look at um, how, you know, how we get jobs working on compute nodes and make use of the resources um, there. So we're going to try and answer some basic questions on what, what is a schedule? Why, why is it used on the HPC system? I think we've already hinted at that a bit. You know, how do we uh, launch programs to run on the compute nodes? Um, and where does the output go? Right, because we talked about input output, you know, how do we find the output from um, a, a program or a job um, that's run on a compute node? Um, and so we'll hopefully run some sort of uh, simple scripts, um, look at the commands we use to interact with the scheduler, and um, then find out where we uh, where where the output goes, and also more importantly where the error messages go as well, because you know, quite often things go wrong, and we want to be able to uh, diagnose that. So. Um, HPC system, as you've seen, I mean, Ar Archer 2 is not up to full size yet, as we, as we mentioned just at, before um, the, the break, but it is um, still pretty large, right? There's 1,023 nodes. About, there should be 1,024, but I think one of them is so broken that it doesn't even show up in the schedule, schedule at the moment. Um, so, but there's thousands of nodes. Eventually, there's going to be like over 6,000 nodes, and we have thousands of users. I mean, I don't know what the number's up to at the moment. But I suspect we have somewhere in the region of two to three thousand registered users um, on the service. Um, and over the lifetime of the previous service, Arch, Archer, where we got up to around six thousand uh, registered users by the end of the service. So that is there's a large amount of resource, but there's also a large number of people wanting to use it. And so, how do we ensure that um, people get the right level of resources they need for their job for for their work, and that it's shared properly? Um, between users and that people are only allowed to use the resources that they've got um, authorization to use. So all of these things are, happen by, are handled by the scheduler. Um, it manages who runs jobs, uh, when they run and where they run. Okay. And it is, I mean, the analogy of a queue is, that is, is exactly the right analogy here. Um, so one good good way of thinking about it or what, one useful way of thinking about it is a waiter at a restaurant you know you have a set of tables which have resources maybe a number of slots a number of chairs and um, that people could potentially sit at um you have uh, some of those ones are already used they've got people sitting in them uh, some of them are free 
and you have a queue of people who want to come and eat um, at the restaurants, the, the diners. And it's the job of the scheduler to say, OK, you can go and sit there for um, two hours um, and then you've got to come out uh, to make space for other people. There's also captures quite nicely the concept of reservations, you know, in that you can reserve space in advance for something, be it a course, excuse me, such as the course we're on today, um, or even for uh, maintenance work. You know, you might want to take that, ta that, that table or that node out of action um, to do some work on it. Um, so it has the concept of um, slots that are busy, that are being used, there's somebody sat in them, um, and so this whole node or whole table is, is busy here with somebody sat in all the slots. But with this one, we're potentially which has less seats, you know, because the nodes might not be the, all the same, except they are on Archer 2. Um, some of the slots might be idle. Um, some of them might be busy. Some of them might have somebody on their way to them already. So they've already been allocated. It's just that the, the work hasn't quite started on them yet. You know, so there's all these concepts of busy, idle, allocated, um, reserved, and the fact that each 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 compute node can have different amounts of resources. Here we're talking about compute cores maybe filled, but resources can also be other things such as um, software licenses. They can be things such as um, uh, amount of memory. They can uh, be other things like that. And you can also see here that on, in general, there's no um, restriction in a in a scheduler on you know allocating a whole node to one person. You know you could subdivide that and allocate resources on nodes to different people. Now on some systems that's not true. And Archer 2 is one of those systems in that what they say is that you know that the nodes are exclusive to users. So if you get a node, you know you're going to be the only person on it and you have access to all the resources on that node. But that's not true of all HPC systems where you might want to subdivide um, compute nodes and, and allocate resources in a more fine, uh, a more fine grained way. So it's the job of the scheduler both allocate and keep track of what's idle, what's allocated, what's available, what's not available. Also, what's been reserved and what the total state of the resource looks like. Um, it's also the job of sh the scheduler to try and make things as efficient as possible. You know, so to try and fit in as many diners or as, many, as much work as possible um, so that the uh, compute resources, uh, so that the resource is efficiently used. And in that sense, as well as looking like a um, a restaurant analogy, it's a bit like a packing problem as well. So if you think of it as Tetris, you have lots of these different sized jobs and you want to pack them together in the most efficient way possible so you can use the resources as efficiently as possible. Um, on Archer 2, the schedule is slow. It is a very popular schedule and a lot of systems you come across and will have, will use slow. It isn't available everywhere. But what I should say is, you know, the, 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 the information and the work we're going to do here, specifically around share slurm, is generally applicable to all the researchers. They're all solving the same, same problem. Some of them might have a slightly different syntax for commands or slightly different commands that you might use. But generally, they'll all have equivalent commands to the ones we're going to use. And they all work in a similar sort of way. It's just the syntax differs slightly. So the concepts and the ideas of the schedule are general, um, the implementation details are maybe a little bit different between different schedules such as PBS or um, or load leveler, if that's the, even still exists, that's the old IBM or, or SLAM. So um, what we, generally the way we work with things is we're on the command line um, and, you know, how we specify how a job puts together and what it wants to do is by creating a script. Now, for those of you that here yesterday, um, Hopefully you, you know that a script is essentially just a file, a text file that contains the list of commands in the order you want to run them. Okay, and the list of bash commands in the order you want to run them. Um, and it, it's nothing more complex than that. The only difference is that it goes away and runs them without manual input. So it just, um, it just does the thing for you. So let's go and create a very simple script that is just gonna print the host name um, of the current node computer that we were running on, that we're running on. Use your own, um, whatever text editor you prefer to use. And uh, the example here is using, using Nano, and that's what I'm gonna use, because that's the course uses. It's usually a good choice for people who aren't used to using text editors that just work in the terminal. Um, but also VI and Emacs are, po are possibilities as well and are commonly used. But let's um, do this. What I'm gonna do first before I, uh, I'm gonna, oops, I've got my command prompt here. 
you notice I'm on Archer 2. So if you're not still not, if you're not logged into Archer 2 at the moment, you should log in to Archer 2. So let's create a uh, simple script. Oops. So nano, I'm going to give it the name of the file I'm going to create. So example, job. Sh. Extensions in Linux don't generally matter, so you can call it whatever you like. Um, so there's a question from Christian. Is there any advantage of using Slurm instead of PBS? Um, so the answer is, I think like any software, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, generally, Slurm, Slurm does a, couple, a few advantages probably over PBS, or so a few of the advantages over Slurm are that um, it's more generally used, so it's more common, so people are more likely to be used to it. Um, it's open source, and PBS is, um, you have to pay for, or PBS Pro certainly you have to pay for. I know there are free, free versions of, of the software out there as well. Um, and it, Slurm was designed from the ground up to scale to very large systems, uh, whereas PBS is a slightly older product and maybe has some things that are maybe more out of date in it. But honestly, a, the honest answer is no, there's not a huge amounts of difference between them. And what typically happens is you get whatever the um, person who sold you the computer uses. And that is often the case. So Archer 2 was bought from HP Cray and it came with Slurm. So Slurm it is in some sense, at least. So let's edit this file. This will put me into the nano interface. So I'm not typing commands now. I'm editing. Uh, I'm editing a file. So I'm going to type in the the uh, the, um, the contents of the file I specified below. Um, so that's bin hash bang bin bash, which specifies which shell we want to use to interpret the commands in the script. In this case, it's bash. Um, and we're going to echo. Thanks, Sam. This script. So the echo minus n command just prints that message um, to the terminal. And oops, sorry, I'm in. And then um, the minus n tells it not to print a new line character um, at the, after it's finished. And then host name prints the name that you've seen before is the command that prints the name of the host we're currently on. So um, I'm going to. Um, save that file, which is um, control O, I guess. I've done something silly, I think, uh, because I was in, yeah, yeah. Okay, save modified butter, yes. Sorry, I don't use nano um, very often. So um, I used control X to save the file. And then the file name to write, it asks me if I want to save it, yes. And then asks me what file I want to write to, and I just press return, and enter. And if I ls, I should have my um, script there ready to go. OK, so now we've got a basic script. Let's try running it and see what happens. So dot slash example job dot sh. Oh, of course, I made the mistake of not making the script executable. So it's, it won't work. So I need to do the chmod uh, u plus, or just chmod plus x, actually, is the easiest way to do it, um, and the name of the file. OK. That turns into an executable script. So it, I can do the dot slash example dot object. And what that tells me is that I can't spell host name. So it tells me that command's not found. So let's do nano and edit the thing again, edit the script again, and type this properly. OK, whose name? And uh, let's save that again. Control X. Uh, yes, yes. Let's try running that again. OK, so it says this script's running on um, UAN01. Um, Hopefully, you've all managed to. Um, get to that stage of being able to create a script and then running it like that. So nothing's actually happened here, really, right? This job, we know that UAM1 is the login node. So after you ran that script um, on the login node. Um, so 
what we need to do now is make it so that um, the script runs on the compute nodes instead, which are managed by the scheduler. Okay. And the way we do that is by submitting, using what's called a submission command to submit the script for execution on one of the compute nodes. And in Slurm, that execution command is called sbatch. Um, sometimes schedules are also known as batch systems or a job that is put into the queue is known as a batch job. Okay, because we're, uh, the system, I guess the scheduler can execute a batch of them uh, simultaneously across the different nodes. So we're going to do that and we're going to use the sbatch command um, to submit our uh, job script. Now, um, we're going to use, we need to specify a few other options here. And that is the partition we're submitting it to. That is the type of compute node we want to use. Um, as um, we're on Archer 2, they're all the same. Actually, there is only one partition at the moment, but that won't be this necessarily true in the future. Um, so we're going to use the standard partition. Uh, the QoS is what, if you've used other batch systems, uh, you would often refer to as the Q. So uh, here in Slurm, it's referred to as a qu it means quality of service. But actually, it's what, resor what resource limits are applied um, to this job. So we on Archer 2 have different QoSs or different Qs, for, for example, for um, quick test jobs, um, for um, jobs that want to use a very large number of nodes, or there's the standard QoS for jobs that fit most requirements. We're going to use the standard QoS here again. And then finally, because we're on this course and we've created a reservation, so your jobs run straight away and don't have to wait in the queue. Um, while if, if the system is busy, we're going to specify a reservation that runs in. And our reservation ID is the name of the course with um, underscore 180 on the end. So I can type that in instead. So let me do that. So we've got S batch minus minus res feature, uh, sorry, minus minus partition. Equals standard QoS standard reservation is TA028 underscore 18. And then the name of the script you want to send into the uh, into the scheduler. So in our case, it's example job.sh. Okay. Um, and let's press return. And so that it tells me a war, it gives me a warning. It says that you're your job has no time specification, the vault time is short. You can cancel your job with whatever you want and you may wish to submit. And uh, then it gives me another warning about um, being on the home file system and that's not available from the compute nodes. Please check this is what you want. Okay. So um, I've still got my script there. So something went wrong. So Slam is telling us two things. Um, the, the thing about the, the wall time, about the time specification, we can ignore for the moment because the host name is going to be very quick to run. So let's not worry about that for the moment. But it is telling us that the file system we're currently on is home. But that's not available on the compute nodes. We need to go to the shared file system that's available to all the compute nodes and to the logger nodes. On Archer 2, this is called the work file system. Now, the path, the path to work is very similar to home, but with work at the start. So we're going to have to move there copy our job script across and, and resubmit um, because otherwise things won't work because it can't access this file storage um, from the compute nodes. So if you remember, um, our home directory um, was this, home dot blah, blah, blah. So we want the same thing um, for um, the work directory, uh, but with work at the front. So we do cd slash work, and then I'm going to copy and paste the rest of it. Um, onto the end of that. And that takes me to my work directory. You can see my prompt has changed um, to show that I'm in the work directory. One useful thing you can do um, straight away to make it easier to get back to your work directory if you find yourself at home, in home, is to um, set, an, set a variable that defines the work directory. So I can say the environment variable work equals um, the current working directory. So $PWD, um, that's an environment variable that's set to where I am at the moment. And I could set another environment variable called work to point to this directory always. So I could always go back there. Um, so if I go, now go home again, 
I should be able to see the dollar work. And that'll take me back. So actually, that's a useful thing. And it can be a useful thing to have set every time you log into the system. And to do that, you can um, edit the bash RC file in your home directory and set that environment variable. So if I hope that home directory dot bash RC, and that'll edit this special file in my home directory. And I can um, export work equals work. Okay, that looks fine. So now every time I log into the system again, even if I logged it in, in between, I can um, cut, I can use um, CD work. Export, um, it, so that's, that's what the export command does. The export command sets the value of that variable, that variable for all um, sessions, uh, sorry, all bash shells that I'm involved in on this login session. Okay, so it, it's like a global set command. I think you could think of it as. Um, in Bash. That's probably not the right technical answer. Um, I could go up and look at the Bash manual and see what it actually describes it, but essentially it sets it for everywhere. Um, so you can reuse so you can reuse it in subshells and things like that. So what are the TA 028 parts again? Okay, so this is the path of the directory. So so each of these slashes is a different direct is a directory, right? So the root directory of everything on the system is slash. Okay, so that's where all the, that's the root of all data on the system, and then I can cd into work, which is the directory, and you'll see there's an entry for every project um, on Archer two. And now our project is TA zero two eight, so all the data for T zero on all the directories for all the all the data and directories for TZ, T, TA zero two eight are in that subdirectory. Okay, and. Um, the reason there's an extra level is because we create shared directories, allow people to share data between projects and within projects. So then there's another TA028 level. And then you'll see there are all the usernames um, within this project. So they're the people on this course, essentially. And there's my one at the start, art TA028. So I've built up the path. Each of these is directory. So this is root. How can PWD was capitalized when essay? Because there's a difference between PWD which is a command, that's a command you run that says print working directory. The dollar PWD is an environment variable that's exported the same way as we did with work, um, that, uh, that contains the contents of this. So current directory. So when you exported work, would you practice once a different variable per project then? Yes, you, you would. But, your account can only ever be in one project. So that would never be a problem because you just set it for that account. So so PWD changes when I change directory. So echo PWD. So it's just got the current work in directory. I could have typed the full path if I wanted. Using the environment variable was just shorthand. Um, to save me having to type work TA0280 slash TA028 slash art TA028. Okay. Ah, and George says, yes, you can actually export the command, but the syntax there is, um, is sort of not quite deprecated, but old fashioned. So actually the way the way to do it for the, um, for, for work would be export work equals if you want to use the command it's dollar and then um parenthesis with the command inside and like that, that that's the uh, that's the um proper uh, that's the sort of accepted syntax for the, for those sorts of things now rather than using and to put the command in so there's lots of i mean this is typical unix linux right i mean there's a million different ways um to, to do the same thing so um, you pick the one that sort of matches on most closely onto what you want and, 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 and what you're comfortable with and what your previous experience and knowledge is. Okay, so the la next thing we need to do, oops, sorry, 
um, is copy um, the file from our home directory, which is our example script, to here. So copy the example job to dot, which is the current directory. Okay, and now we could do our submit a command again. And um, so what I'm actually going to do is use the up arrow to scroll back because I don't want to type that whole submit, whole submit command again. So it should be back there somewhere. There it is, s batch, da da da. I can do it that way. So let's try that again. Okay, so this time we get the warning about the time again, but we don't get the warning about the file system. <coughs> Excuse me. And we get this message about submitted batch job and then some ID number. So it gives you an ID for what where your job is in the queue. Um, and we check our job status, we use the SQ command and then minus U with our user ID. So we can look at all our jobs in the queue, but minus U, um, what's mine, art, TA, 028. And there's nothing listed, okay, which is maybe not quite what we're expecting. But the reason for that is that um, this job ran very, very quickly. So by the time it took me to explain those things and then run the SQ command, um, the job had finished. Um, so if that's empty, that means the job's finished. If it if it's still been there and running, you would have seen something more like this in the, from, the, from the script. Uh, bash RC file is always in your home directory. So that's uh, squiggle slash home rec. So something like that. So um, just in your home directory, and it gets read automatically every time you log in. Okay, so um, we submitted the job, um, hopefully it ran, and we can um, look at it, you know, hopefully it ran. Okay, it's definitely finished in some way. And there's some notes here about how you can use the watch command um, to keep an eye on things that take time to run. There's not much point for this 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 job here um, as it's running so long, but we may use it um, later on when we run some longer running jobs to give to, to keep it out things keep. So I'll just skip over that for right now. Um, but the question is now, where's the output gone? Okay, usually when we type a command, right? So the command we had in there was essentially host name. When we type a command like that interactively, it comes back to us on the terminal and it gives us our prompt back. Okay, but obviously it can't do that when it's running a job, because we could have logged off. We could have gone away, we could have not been sat there. There may not have been a terminal there at all for it to print the output to. So it's got to put the output somewhere um, that we can find. And typically, uh, our, what batch systems do is redirect this to a file in the directory you've launched it from. So we can use ls to look and see if we can find that file. So ls um, here, sorry, I've got a, um, let me, get rid of that directory that's getting in the way and confusing things. Okay, so we've got our example job script and we've also got this file that's called slurm dash some, some number dot out. And we look closely at that number there, it should match the number you got back when you submitted the job. Okay, um, so this file contains the output from our job and it stores it in a file from us rather than puts the terminal because we can't be clear sure there's a terminal there. So let's so there's the file. So let's have a look at what's in it. So I'm going to use cat. Um, hopefully you've seen that command before, which prints the contents of a text file back to the terminal and the name of the file. Okay. Okay. So now this time. When we ran it before, without the S batch command, we got back, this script is running on UAN01. We now get this script is running on NID001001. And that's one of the compute nodes, okay? So this job, this script that we wrote is now running on one of the compute nodes rather than one of the, rather than interactive, rather than on our login node, okay? So, hope, I'm going to put a thing. So, if, so if, can we get to the stage where everybody can submit a job? That might be a useful thing to do. I'll put a poll, just a quick poll, just to um, check that.
Okay, so there's some of you sort of can one of the uh, helpers go and help out people who are answering no, please. Uh, yeah, I'm helping. Fine, thanks. So, Salas, could you go over the options um, in SBAT, partition standard, QS standard, reservation in Yeah, Of course I can. So, this is where schedulers do differ sometimes in what these options are called and what, what types of, you know, what types of option are available. Yeah. So, in Slurm, a partition generally represents a type of hardware or type of compute node. Okay, so you could imagine a partition might be um, a standard compute node or a high memory compute node or a compute node with um, GPU accelerators attached. You know, so and each HPC system might have multiple partitions. You know, there might be, um, like I say, those ones with different hardwares and things like that. Whereas a QoS or quality of service tends to indicate the limits that are placed on um, job scripts that are in a QoS. So, for example, you might say you're going to be able to run jobs um, up to a maximum of 256 nodes in size, or that can run for a maximum amount of time of 24 hours. You know, so the QoS, which is often referred to as a Q. In other, batch, in other batch systems, such as PVS, sets the limits on what you're able to do. Okay, so the combination of the partition, the type of hardware, and the QoS specifies what type of node you want to run on and what limits are applied to that node. Now, generally, the larger the limits, the less, um, you know, not all limits are made the same. So, what you might typically find is that if you're running smaller jobs in a standard QoS, you'll be able to run lots of them. But if you're running in a QoS that supports very large jobs, you'll be restricted to running less of them at once, so you can't use up as, uh, too much of the system and make it unavailable for other people. Okay, so so QoSs are usually designed to balance that um, the amount of resources that any one user can take at any one time to make to try and ensure fair access across the system to all the multiple users are making using the system. Finally, the reservation one is saying, don't just put this into the general queue with everybody else. I've got a specific reservation. These are a set of nodes that are being kept specially for the work I want to do at the moment. And um, use them instead, please. Okay, so rather than routing it to the general queue where everybody's queuing up and spending their time, which is generally what happens most of the time. In this specific case, because we're running a course and we want people to have quick turnaround of their jobs, otherwise it becomes very difficult, um, then we have a reservation where there's a set of nodes that nobody else could use except the people who are on this course. Um, and that reservation specification says, I've got my account has access to those nodes, please use them instead rather than going into this general pool. Okay. Does that give you enough? Does that help explain it? I know it is a bit, it is a bit tricky. And it, it is a bit weird that there's so many options you have to specify um, right at the start. Generally, um, you'll add those um, options all the time. But as you'll see in a moment, what we're going to go on is, is how you specify those options within the job script itself. Okay, so that you don't have to type the big long command line. All you need to do, type is sbatch and the name of the job, and it contains all those specifications inside it already, uh, which should make things easier. So the next thing we're going to do is look at customizing a job. So, you know, we just, one of the things we did then was we ran with a lot of default settings. And the default settings uh, we ran with, one of them the schedule warned us about was that we hadn't given it much time to run. So the job had been running longer than, say, a minute or something like that. It might have um, just been stopped. And the chances are that it's probably giving us some um, small amounts of resources as well in terms of number of nodes or number of cores and things like that. And we usually want more than that. And in a, in, let, me, let me go back to my uh, job script. In, um, in Linux, Unix, or whatever you want to call it, Linux is an example of a Unix-like uh, operating system. In job scripts, these, this symbol hash or um, 
yeah, the, this hash symbol indicates comment usually, like something that's not to be interpreted as a command. There are some exceptions. One exception is this one you see at the top here. If the hash is followed by an exclamation mark and is the first line of the script, then it is instead interpreted as which scripting language should I use to process this script? In this case, we're saying bash. Other scripts are available, okay, but not, but other scripts are not supported on Archer 2. Okay, but there are other ones out there. For example, on my command line on my Mac, I use ZSH, okay, which is the default um, script with Macs now, rather than Bash. Okay, um, so I could add a when I mean a comment, I could say it's a um, this prints out the host name. Now it's a pretty useless comment, but it's explaining what those um, those next lines do, and that is just not interpreted by the script when you run it. This is nothing happens. It doesn't try to run commands. It, doesn't, it just ignores this line. The other exception is when we use them for the scheduler um, to specify other options. And then it's a hash. And in Slurm, it's followed by SBatch, all capital letters. And they have to be capital letters. OK, so when Slurm processes a script, it looks for special lines that begin with hash SBatch. Um, and then interprets them as command line options, the sbatch command. So, for example, we could have put in here. Uh, Christy asked, does bin bash mean there's a bash executable in bin folder? Yes, it, that is exactly what it means. Uh, so everything, I'm, I'm going to say everything, it is literally everything just about in Linux, Unix is a file. Everything, executables, drivers, processes. Yeah, you can ls the things, you can um, do whatever you want. Um, so we can add these options that we we're specifying on, the, specifying on the command line here in SBatch, and we can add other options. So one option that we might want to use to help us distinguish our jobs is to give it a job, job name. So I'm going to give this one as a name, something like simple job. Okay. The other thing I might want to add here to save me having to type the long command line we were typing is um, the partition and QoS and reservation options to make things easier. So sbatch minus minus partition equals standard. Um, sbatch minus minus QoS equals standard. Sbatch minus minus reservation equals standard. Okay. Yeah, not standard. Oh, that's wrong. TA028 underscore 180 is the right answer there. Okay. Now, one thing. So you can see these are exactly the same ones that are specified the command line. I can just specify them on separate lines with Sbatch. That's fine. You might be asking, why? put a hash at the front. If hash is already used for so many things, you know, it's already used for comments and things like that. Well, the reason hash is used at the front here like this is exactly because it's used as comment uh, for comment. So what this means is this gives us a script now we can execute and it behaves fine when we just execute it interactively. Okay. But also it does something more when we, it does something slightly different when we submit it to the batch system. It picks up those options. Okay, so it works in both scenarios. That's why hash is used. So let me show, show you that. So let's save that as example job. Touch. I can still do that and it works, right? Because when I run it interactively, those comments that begin with, eh, with um, hash, s batch, are just ignored because it fixed the comments. They're only picked up as something special when we submit it through, yeah, through the Slurm commands. So now I could do um, sh example job script. I don't need all the other options because they're written in the job script itself. And we've changed the job name. And if I'm quick, I might be able to catch it running. Um, but I can't type fast enough, so I'm going to miss it. Oh, I've got the wrong user, but it doesn't matter. But I'm not quick enough to see it running. But if you'd been, been able to see it running, you would have seen that the job name was different. Everything was fine. And if I LS here, you can see I've got another Slurm output file matching the job ID when I submitted this time. 
Let me cap that again. 735 90, that one is. And you see it's running on a different uh, compute node from the last one. Um, we ran it on. Okay, so we can customize a job by adding in um, job names and you know it says submit with this uh, this sort of thing but actually it's easier just to put them in the job script and then you don't need to type them into each time you type in the command which is really really tedious okay so we changed the job name which is pretty trivial um but the things we actually probably want to do is things like uh, change the number of nodes uh change the number of tasks per node that's how many cores we're using per node generally um and change how long the job might want to run for uh, at the time the job can run for and there are various options um for this you know and as i said you know you, all of these options we're supplying on the command line we can actually put in the script using the hash slash command so so let's um can you modify our simple script so that it, it runs for a minute rather than using default time okay so you should be able to look up here uh, find the right option um, edit the script and then um, run it again make sure the queue accepts it and it prints out the right thing uh, with the with the time set to a minute instead of um, just taking the default time so we're at 4 11 41 now according to my clock so I'll give you um say five minutes to have a quick go at that and get a job submitted uh, and check that it's working i'll put a poll again to check um when people have completed that task and you know, if, if you're struggling, either put your hand up or answer no to the poll, and one of us will come and help you out with that. Uh, as, as always, type questions, please, in the chat and ask things if you want. So, uh, so I, I think there's a couple of people who haven't uh, had have maybe issues, or at least one person having issues. George. Uh, no, sorry, it was me. I was trying to see who'd having issues and I inadvertently said that I had issues because I clicked on no. Okay, fine. I, I'm well, not very good at using the user interface. Ignore so, so, so one of the helpers will come, come, come and look at that with you. Um, but most people should be there. So what I'll do is I'll stop this and show, show how to do it. Uh, so let's have a look at our job script again. Okay, so the option to add time um, from here is minus minus time. So So we can add s batch minus minus time. It tells us the number of days is optional, and it's not often. Usually, people don't. You know, or sometimes people use days, but not often. But so we're going to choose hours, minutes, seconds, and we wanted one minute, so zero, one, zero, um, would be fine. Um, so, Cameron asks, I've got I've got this new file in my folder, example dog job dot dot squiggle what's this i think that's a back or automatic backup file from um, nano or if you're using emacs it'd be an automatic backup file for emacs i think that's an e that looks like an emacs thing maybe rather than a nano thing but anyway. yeah yeah so emacs takes a backup of the last one the last copy you edited and give puts a tilde on the end um, for you and so you'll, you'll build up lots of files with squiggles on the end if you uh if you use Emacs all the time. So, so how do I set two hours then? So that's one minute. So hours is here. So I change that to two and that's a zero. So that would be two hours. Two hours, zero minutes, zero seconds. No, so two days would be two dash zero. So that's two days, zero hours, zero minutes, zero seconds. Okay, but the days is optional. So if it doesn't, if it just has the colons, it assumes hours, minutes, seconds, because that's a really common pattern um, that people use. Okay. Um, so let me save that. Um, yes. Yes. Fine. So what happens if you submit a job of a time longer than available in the QS? Then you get an error um, from, from the system. I can try and do that. So I think the standard QRS that we're using has a time limit of 24 hours. So let me try and submit a two-day job. Right, and let's see what it says. Uh, 
Um, so I've specified the time as two, two days. There you go. So request the time is invalid, missing or exceeds some limit. So um, I can't submit a two-day two job into the standard QoS because the limit is um, just is just uh, what is one day, twenty-four hours. Okay. So one thing I should say is that S batch and slow has lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of options, right? If you're interested in, in looking at them, you can look them up quite easily. If you just uh, Google for uh, man S batch. Um, you could also do this on the on the system on the system, and then that should give you the Sloan work at the manager S batch, which will be the file, which is the page that lists all the different options. Yeah, man stands for manual. It's the same command that works here. You can always look at the the option the options on the system as well and scroll through it in the same way you would using less or more and then Q to quit. Um, it's just, it's often easier to look at it in a web browser because when it's in the terminal, you can't actually type anything in the terminal, which is a bit, which is annoying. So, um, but man works in Google as well. It knows what you need. Uh, the other option I should point out here is that, that's useful in Slurm and, and I think it exists in other batch systems as well. Sometimes you can specify a variable limit. So you can say, you know, give me some time between, I'm happy with this minimum, but if this maximum is available, I'll take that as well. I'll, I'll take that or I'll take any time in between uh, because my job is just doing iterations and I don't, it doesn't matter too many it stops because I could just carry on from that point. And um, so there is syntax to select that and then it will do it. That gives the schedule more flexibility to slot you in. And so it might mean your job runs sooner than if you just specified the very longest time. Um, but you might still get the very longest time if that's available to you. Um, so there are those sorts of options as well, but it, it, there's information on that in the Archer 2 documentation on how to do that. Okay, so that's what we did was, um, well, this one was running in for uh, one minute, uh, one minute, 15 seconds. Yeah. Okay. Uh, fine, and then this one runs this uh, sleep command as well, which tells it to, tells the, tells it to just wait for 60 seconds and then not a while it doesn't do anything. Okay. And so we've already talked um, about environment variables a bit. I showed you where I set my own environment variable work um, to allow me to move um, straight to the work directory. And Slurm does the same automatically. When you submit a job, it sets various environment variables that you can then use in your script to access things like how many CPUs were requested, how many nodes were requested, um, and, and all those sorts of things. And so you can, you know, once you set things or things happen, then you can do useful things with those environment variables in, in, your, in your script if you want to. And so it's worth knowing um, that that's available to you. Um, but the resource requests we put in are typically binding. So, you know, if you exceed them, your job will be killed. Okay, so let's use the wall time. Here. So we're going to request 30 seconds of wall time, and then I'm going to try and run a job um, by using sleep that runs for 120, uh, that runs for two minutes. Okay, so let's do that. So I'm going to put in the time of 30 seconds. And I'm going to put in a sleep here for two minutes. Okay, 120 seconds, two minutes. And save, save. Okay, so let's submit that. And let's look at the queue. Okay, so you can see there, now we've actually managed to catch it. It's been running for eight seconds so far. It's in the state running. I can run that again. That's been running for 15 seconds. So it's good. 20 seconds. 22 seconds. 25. 58. Hopefully it's going to die in a minute, but it's at 30 seconds. So it's gone over slightly. Still gone over. So one thing that you'll notice here is it doesn't get killed on exactly the right the right amount of time. That's because there's an um, the scheduler has a cycle, you know, and so it doesn't have that granularity of that many seconds um, to kill it kill it in time. 
ought to kill it at the right time. That's weird, though. It should have killed it by now, I think. Did I make a mistake in my job script? That's what's happened here. Time, zero, zero, 30. That looks fine. Okay, so it's stopped now. Let's have a quick look at the output and see what it says. So that's the latest one. Okay, so it was, it's just the granularity is maybe on the order of 30 seconds um, for killing jobs or something like that, um, rather than uh, down to the second. But you can see you get this um, error said it was canceled because of time limit. So it went over its 30 seconds that it was um, allocated. So then it was killed um, by by the by, by the by this by the scheduler uh, because he'd only asked for 30 seconds. So this is yeah, it says in the documentation this sounds harsh, but this is the only way uh, the scheduler can work. You know, it, it unless it knows what time is available, it can't do the packing problem and the placement problem to you know when know when jobs are potentially finished and then schedule all the jobs in the future. Now it may be that jobs finish before they hit the wall time. That's fine. Okay, I don't know. Um, camera, we're, I, can, I have to. Have a look, but I just want to fi finish this point because um, uh, then we're going to stop for lunch anyway. So it just makes um, you know, it has to have, be able to be confident that the job will finish and ma the maximum time a job will take will be the time specified in the job script. Otherwise, it can't actually schedule jobs in the future. Now, maybe that jobs finish early. That's fine, and then it can do some. Um, you know, we can recalculate um, the job. It, it, we can recalculate the scheduling and try to fit things in. But um, in general, things get killed if they try to use too much resource. Okay, and that may use often time, but sometimes people make mistakes in the specifying their job scripts and might say, you know, I and request two nodes, but then try to run across four. Um, and then, and then you, you know, you'll get an error as well because you're trying to exceed the resources. Um, and as it says here, you know, how much does it actually cost to run the job? And so although a job's killed when it hits the selected run time, the job completes the time it is only charged for the time it's actually used, right? So the general rule of form on almost all HPC systems is that um, you're charged for the time you use, not for the time you request. Okay, so um, the amount of time that the resource is unavailable to all the users is how we compute. Um, or how much it's charged. So on Archer 2, it's essentially number of nodes times the length, length of time the job ran for, not number of nodes times the length you requested, unless your job actually ran to the end of its time limit. Okay. Um, and there is some, you, you might then ask, you know, why should I, shouldn't I just put in the maximum time all the time, right? Because then I'll get, um, you know, then, then there's all, never the chance of it being killed, or at least I know you know, I'm going to get 24 hours. Well, the challenge, the, the the reason for not doing that is that if you specify a time that's closer to the time it actually takes, then the schedule has more flexibility to fill it in and small, fit it in in smaller gaps. So there's also a chance of your job starting sooner. Um, but you know, it's perfectly valid to specify um, 24 hours, even though your job might not run for 24 hours um, if, you, if, you, if you're unsure of how long it will take. But you may find you get more efficient throughput if you uh, are better estimating how long your job actually takes okay yes exactly george so yes uh, it's always harder to book a table for six hours than it is for a to fill a 30 minute slot and uh, continuing the restaurant analogy okay so we're um quite a lot uh, we're most of the way through um this in this schedule session we've got a, a couple of other small topics to touch on but we're at 12 o'clock and I promised we would finish at 12 o'clock for uh, lunch and then come back at half one. So that's what we'll do now. I'll stick around for um, a few minutes in case people have any questions following on from that session, but we'll pick up where we left off um, at half one um, this afternoon. Um, and you know we've got plenty of time to cover uh, the other topics uh, this afternoon. And you know, if we, get, if we don't get right to the end of the course, we don't get right to the end of the course. But you know, it's you know, but I think we're fine, we're fine and on schedule. Uh, but thank you for all your questions. Uh, that really does help us here and to know what is interesting to you and you know the information you need. So 
Um, it, it's great to have you asking asking the questions. That's really useful. So um, I'll stick around for a few minutes in case anybody has any other questions on what we've covered so far. But otherwise, um, enjoy your break. Um, it's certainly lovely here, so I'm going to go outside and get some fresh air and stretch my legs. And I'll see you back here at half past one. UK time, half past one BST. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>